And I'm Jessica. I'm a physics teacher from Connecticut, and I've taught Girls Who Code in various different um, areas. The motivation for our talk and um, for running a code specifically for girls is because um, studies by NC WIT, which is the National Council of Women in Technology, have shown a variety of motivational aspects that can be different than what traditional classrooms tend to see. Um, one is that women would like to see an, like the ability of technology to help them uh, help society. Um, they feel welcomed when there are a lot of projects and a lot of collaboration as opposed to a lecture style. And they want to be able to take risks. They want to be able to make mistakes. And it's also really important that um, women have accurate knowledge about what computing careers look like. Um, these are obviously not the only issues that the gender gap in computing faces, but they are contributing factors that we hope we can um, help with. So, um, so as many girls get discouraged from doing computer science as early as middle school, we really wanted to focus on building a community for these younger girls. Um, the, we're going to talk about our experiences, so there are many, many, many resources out there. These are ones specifically that we have used. Um, some of our goals were building a community, building self-confidence, and helping bridge the gender gap. So uh, we broke this talk into three different parts. First is getting started in code in Python, so what we used that we found useful. Working with local communities and logistics on how we were able to successfully create a club. And then we want to prepare these girls for a career in computer science. So we really want to build their confidence and curiosity beyond this, beyond this club. So getting started with code in Python. So when I first learned computer science, it was a screen. It was just very typing. It wouldn't work because there was never a semicolon. And it was very, there was like a really steep learning curve. So when you're trying to get girls interested in like middle school, that's not really going to work. So you need to make programming fun for all ages. And these girls often come in with no knowledge of programming. They don't understand that the program does exactly what you tell it to do, and that's it. So that's definitely a struggle. They don't understand that there are bugs. They're like, is there something around? Like, what do you mean a bug? Um, they don't understand basic variables. Some of them haven't even taken algebra yet. So that's a way that we connect. We can teach that concept, but they don't even know what that is. And then different words like control structure, program flow, syntax, those are all foreign concepts to them. So as I think most of us probably know, Scratch is a great resource for this. It's a very user-friendly environment. It's a click and drag, so there's no typing. There's no really chance for syntax errors. There's this little sprite that will do whatever it tells. It's very colorful, very user-friendly. Kids especially like because you can, include, you can include your own images so they can make it about their own room or whatever they're interested in. Um, with Scratch, you can also create pretty complex programs. So this is an example of um, three of my girls did over the summer. They created a maze game using Scratch. And here they had like a day where they planned the project, and then they created a minimal viable product, and then they created all these different levels and all these different complex code, and this is just a small image of it. Um, so they are to create a timer, use control, so really a pretty complex project that they had a week to do. And so Scratch is great with those kinds of projects. Other resources are like code.org. So my school put on the Hour of Code, where students from every, for the entire school, tried to different um, programs. So this is just an example of Anna and Elsa, where they really like make it a game to make Elsa behave in certain ways. They have a lot of different examples on code.org. Some are like more for Minecraft. They have age recommendations. Um, my students like doing this one where you can make a little sprite dance and to different music, and they really enjoyed that. So it's really a lot of opportunities for students to do whatever they find interesting. Um, beyond some drag and drop programs, there's a variety of ways you can get kids out of their seats and moving with technology that we found was good as far as like bringing kids together in an after school program where they're not necessarily all from the same school and don't know each other that well right away. So games like um, when you're illustrating if statements play a game of Simon Says and they'll realize that if you do something, you do something else, but not if you don't say Simon Says, do not touch your nose, that kind of thing. So um, another big one was variables. Um, we found that especially with girls that are middle school and younger, um, teaching variables was pretty difficult. So um, our favorite way of illustrating that was with 
a cup, a sticky note on the outside that has the variable name, and a crumpled up piece of paper on the inside that has a variable value. So um, kids had fun with that kind of thing too. Um, Coasters is something that Meg already talked about, and we found that it actually works really well for after-school programs that might have inconsistent attendance. Um, so Coasters, which you mentioned earlier, has a drag-and-drop element, um, Python code, as well as sprites and characters that you make move with the Python code. So um, the reason that Coasters worked so well, we thought, is because um, kids can see the response of characters right away, they learn how to fix bugs, and they learn what a bug actually is, as well as because it's individual lesson plans, students that might not show up every week or skip a week inconsistently can pick up where they left off. Um, it's also really great for a wide range of ex instructor experience levels because our students, our instructors range from like professional coders and software engineers to new coders, so the fact that Every lesson has a like instructions that students need to follow means that new instructors can read the instructions along with the students. Um, one example of a really cool game that some of our students made with Codesters was um, they wanted to make a environment themed game featuring um, cleaning up the ocean. So this was um, something that they had a lot of fun with, I thought, and this was actually made by fifth graders. So um, the, oh, never mind, sorry. The, um, the, the students had fun with this because they were able to come up with like a minimum viable product of, oh, like we want the quiz to have at least three questions. They were able to come up with like advanced ideas like, okay, we want a advanced version of the game and an easy version of the game, and it worked pretty well for the fact that they can customize what they want. Um, so the last thing as far as like teaching kids Python themselves is um, there's a lot of advantages to starting with a debugger, and a Spider has a great one. And if you're not able to use Spider and you're able, and you have to use something like Jupyter Notebooks, then pythontutor.com will let you copy paste code in and watch it execute, which is great especially for um, stuff like lists and pointers. Um, it'll have actual arrows. And this resource is good if you're a Chromebooks and you can't like download Python, it's available online. Um, so our club of Girls Who Code had a pretty wide range of skill sets. We had students on Scratch and we had students that wanted to learn like true code because they wanted to take AP Computer Science the next year. So what worked for us was keeping a spreadsheet of where each student was and updating it weekly. Um, the other thing that we had them do is we had them use a Kanban board where they had like a to-do column, a doing column, and a done column. So um, they had fun moving their sticky notes across the board and keeping track of their own progress as well. Um, this helped us get ready for final presentations, which we'll talk more about in a minute. And it also allows a lot of flexibility if you have drop-in volunteers that are coming in for one week, then they can help a student that they think they have knowledge about how to help them. Uh, yeah, so now we'll talk about like the other aspect beyond just like helping students learn code. The perhaps bigger one is like getting a community together, getting the logistics handled. Um, so what worked for me, because I was a software engineer when I was looking for a community to join, is that I was just Googling stuff like STEM tutoring in Connecticut and um, how to help women in tech in Connecticut. <laughs> and I found, um, I found a local community leader um, who ran a local nonprofit and was a retired school principal in the area that wanted to get more people like me in. So I contacted her through her website that she had up already and we met up and we started planning. Um, people talked about local libraries before. That is where we hosted the club that Jessica and I worked at together. That's great because libraries have computers and they already have all the resources that you need. And the woman that I was working with had um, not only some other people that she wanted to bring in as well as some at a lot of connections within the community to other school teachers and recruiting students. Yeah, and for me to join, it was really, really simple. I had worked with Girls Who Code over the summer and I wanted to continue with the fall. 
So I looked up online. You could do this with Girls Who Code or other organizations. This is just what I have experience with. And I found Neha's group that was within walking distance of my apartment. I was like, oh, this is perfect. Um, so it's really pretty easy. Girls Who Code, I know, specifically has ones all over the country. And they're expanding internationally, I think, to Canada and maybe some other places. Um, some other um, opportunities, if you can't commit to like a full year club, is just doing a one-day workshop at a company. That's a great experience for girls or for any students. And then, since I'm a teacher, one way to recruit is just to talk to guidance counselors, other teachers, students, have them bring a friend to the club to try to recruit more people and just kind of get the word out there. So one major part of our group was to have presentations. So we had the girls twice a year show their work off to their family, their friends, and different people like that. Um, this was a great opportunity because girls, and I think all students, are not great at public speaking, but fortunately you'll never public speak to more friendly people than your family and friends, so it's a great place for them to try out new things. They are able to show off their work um, and then also show it off to people who might want to join in the future, so we got a lot of new people joined just through these things. We also encourage the older girls to kind of help with the younger girls to show them how it works. And then some of our older girls were commuting from a little bit farther to come to our club, so they actually created their own club more locally available to them after they saw, after they tried it out with us. Um, so our kind of one part next was trying to prepare these girls for a part after the club. So this is building a group community, building confidence and curiosity beyond the scope of this club. So one key feature is these women tech spotlights. So I think a lot of people, especially young girls, might think that computer scientists might be older, male, and white. And we want to really show them that that's not necessarily true. Um, so there's the idea that you can't be what you can't see. So if they don't have role models that they can identify with, it's going to be hard to get them to continue with this career. So pretty much every lesson or whenever we had time, we would try to do these women tech spotlights. So some people we talked about were like Ada Lovelace a famous computer scientist from, I think, the 1800s, who was one of the first computer scientists. We also wanted to make sure that we provided a diverse role model. So this is Ayana Howard, who is a robotics engineer who helped work with NASA. So we talked about her. We kind of ran these in different ways. Sometimes the girls would repair it, and then we'd have a group discussion. Sometimes we'd like put a name or show a video, have the girls do a little bit of research on their own, and then bring it back to a group discussion. But I think having these role models was really important because you could see different girls really connect with different people that we were talking about. Yeah, the benefit to those is largely that um, you have the chance to bring in um, girls that get excited about technology, even if they aren't during the course of like six weeks to 12 weeks able to necessarily become Python experts and they're still just getting comfortable with variables, at least they're excited about technology and excited about what's to come. So another big way that we did that was incorporating emerging areas of technology, um, by which I definitely don't mean like blockchain and Kubernetes, I mean like stuff that kids already know what it is, so they know that they need clean water, and if we're able to find a YouTube video about, you know, um, a woman that works at UNICEF that is helping create technology for clean water, then that's something that they get excited about and they're able to immediately see the ways that they can potentially have a career that impacts society and impacts other people using technology. Um, so we would talk about stuff like um, health technology, um, design of like heating fabrics is what that one is, and a lot of different exciting areas for them to be able to potentially think of career opportunities with and think about like new innovations with. Um, you can also encourage the girls to bring in their own ideas, and so whatever they're interested in. Um, my, in one of my classes, we had like a whole discussion about like self-driving cars and how we thought that might be good for this society or how it might be bad. So just getting their interest in it. So one of the key features of this is building a sisterhood or building a community of girls. So beyond the co beyond the club, they'll feel like they have people that have their back. So we tried to build connections in some really simple ways. So one key way is just to make sure the girls are sitting next to each other and not in desks farther away. You really want to encourage this collaboration and have the girls help each other whenever it's possible. So if two girls are working on a similar assignment, maybe they can be like, oh, I have a question. Oh, you just answered that question. Like, you just had the same bug. Now you figured it out. Can you help me? Also encourage girls of older ages help with the younger girls. So like for one of our projects, we had the older girls build a website that then hosted all the other girls' projects, which was a really cool way for them to all see that they were working towards a goal together. 
Um, we also had them end the year by working on group projects. So for example, we had three, I think they're all in middle school, work on a project about endangered species. And they each researched like a panda and different things. And they had so much fun looking at pictures and all this stuff. And then they each created their own project in Codesters and came together to show like that endangered species are important. And they really bonded by just like brainstorming that project as a group. Um, yeah, so I definitely recommend like trying to reach out to local communities and finding ways that you can potentially get started with a club like this. Like I was at the time that I found a local community leader to start this with, I was looking for committing like two to five hours a week. But um, we also had volunteers coming in that were committing like just one or two and maybe just twice a month. Um, so there's a wide range of ways you can get committed to these types of like long run after school programs or summer programs. Um, but the biggest thing that I would say is that like experience probably not as needed as long as you're willing to be there and be encouraging and um, make sure that things are fun for people too. Yeah, we are also really fortunate in our group that we had people that had, there were like four or five of us who each had different skills. So like I came in from more of an educator background, Neha and some other people came from more of a computer science background. So together we were really able to put something um, that the girls really enjoyed and we felt like we could work together um, well. Okay. Um, if there's any questions, I think we're pretty much done. Now, I know that Girls Code is more geared towards younger girls. Not, 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 or that's, uh, that's an overgeneralization. The target audience tends to be younger girls, because even at my own institution, the Girls at Code really focuses on, on local uh, elementary school, and, or mm. middle school and elementary school, and I mm. think there's some high schoolers. But how do you bridge that gap past scratch to more intermediate level stuff? Yeah, so they're like, um, I teach it for them over the summer, and the first week is Scratch, and the second week is Python, and that is the hardest week of the seven-week program. It is so painful. Um, I would say what you just have to do is go really, really slow. So like the curriculum had us doing like a hangman thing on the third day, and it's it was a disaster. So then on the fourth day, we went back and did like a guessing game, and that worked so well. And you're like, oh, wait, you can't like put 10 lines of code. There's no way you could have done this hangman. So I think that's when you just like have to really like slow down and be patient. And that's when like um, we always had helpers, and you just have them like really ready. Like you got to be ready to go and help um, with that. So it is really a challenging thing. I think the student-teacher ratio is really important for yeah. that as well. Mm -hmm. Being able to have multitude of volunteers, even if they're just dropping in for one time, works really well. And if you're at a place where you can like broadcast to all of your friends, all of the software engineers and data scientists that you know, that works really well. I would just say that like the biggest thing we would look at would be whether or not students wanted to return the next year as well as like the general vibe that they had because this is all up to them whether or not they come. It's not um, something that they have to come to. It's not a school program, it's after school. They could just quit if they wanted. So we definitely consider the fact that they kept coming back and their parents kept dropping them off <laughs> as meaning that like they wanted to and their parents thought it was valuable for them. Um, yeah. yeah, we didn't necessarily do surveys or anything like that, but I'm sure you could find some on the Girls Who Code's website. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's so a question. Yeah, so I would say, like, I think some of the girls, when they first go in, they're, like, concerned to say, like, oh, I'm interested in this, but then they find another girl that's, like, also interested in this, and they, like, bond over video games, which is something, like, they might not necessarily feel, like, share, because it's not necessarily a female thing to really enjoy. So I think just, like, it gives them more of a space where they can be brave and take risks that they might not take in other environments. Thank you. Thank you.